get things started. We're hoping she'll be back soon, and we look forward to her triumphant return to the table. And today, our guest co-host is New York Times op-ed writer Barry Weiss, ladies and gentlemen. Hey. Welcome. Hey. And I'm sorry, my old friend from college, Barry. I'm we went so to Columbia excited. together. I promise she not also, to share any embarrassing Megan stories from I, Columbia. I, last night, I emailed. I was like, no Columbia stories. <laughs> so, okay. Okay. So the hot topic that is breaking this morning is a bombshell expose in the New Yorker that claims that for, for uh, Fox News killed, <clears throat> watch this, killed the Stormy Daniels story. So it wouldn't hurt Trump's campaign. So much for the free press. The article claims that Fox News entertainment reporter Diana Falzone, I think that's how she Diana says Falzone. Well, she's Italian. It's Falzone, all right? <laughs> <laughs> Diana brought them the story, but the head of the FoxNews.com at the time, Ken Lacourt, I presume that's not Lacorte, <laughs> told her, quote, good reporting, kiddo, but Rupert Murdoch wants Donald Trump to win, so let's just let it go. Hmm. So does this prove that Fox News is just a mouthpiece for the Trump administration or what? Didn't we already know that? I mean, yeah. the Jane Mayer story is a bombshell, not just because of the Stormy Daniels revelation, the fact that they killed it because they cared about promoting Trump more than they cared about an unbelievable news story, yeah. right? So on that score, it proves that it's more propagandistic than it is about news. But then there's this other bombshell, which is that Gary Cohen intervened with the Justice Department in the AT&T Time Warner merger in order to help President, in order to help enact President Trump's vendetta against CNN. Yeah. So, I'm sorry, isn't that abuse of power? It I sounds mean, forgetting like even the Jared Kushner security clearance abuse of power. Yeah. That alone And by the way, Rupert Murdoch is Australian, so not just the Russians are bothering us. <laughs> <laughs> you have that piece, too. I mean, it's, it's, it's just a terrible thing. It does show that there's this um, incredible notion that it's, Fox News has become, I guess, state-run television. Um, I wonder if you can trust the journalism that's coming out of Fox News now. And, and I think what worries me is that you do have some good journalists there. I mean, yeah. Chris Wallace being one of them. And so what does that do to someone like Chris Wallace, who I think tries really hard um, to get it right? Has and, he and responded to this news by any chance? Does anyone broke. know? I, it just broke. And then I wonder about this reporter, um, uh, Falzone, who, you know, Ronan Farrell won a Pulitzer Prize for this reporting and so that story was hers first and you have her employer taking that opportunity away from her and taking that story away from the American public right before an election I mean had everyone known about Stormy Daniels I mean would they have voted for this president yes maybe not they still would have voted for him I don't know that influenced I think the outcome of the election there's another part of the uh, Fox story from Jane Mayer that alleges and this is not uh, 100% at this point, you probably know more about this than I do, that somebody, Rupert Murdoch, might have given the question about that, what's her name? Oh, the uh, Megyn Kelly. Megyn Kelly, Kelly was going to ask Trump, remember, which annoyed him about sexual abuse. It said that Roger Ailes, I Roger guess, Ailes, not right, that's right. And, he and told by the way, her, and, and so he, after he said, you know, she's bleeding, bleeding from the wherever, mm -hmm. he still got all the votes. Wait, so they realized he was Teflon at that point, if this is true. Oh, so that's, that's a see. piece of yeah. this, and again, this is all like allegedly, mm -hmm. um, but I do think the biggest part of the piece is the Stormy Daniels story, and Meg and I, look, we both worked at Fox, I can only speak for myself at the table, I worked under the news division, I worked in the bureau mm -hmm. with all the reporters when I first got there, and I worked on an opinion <laughs> show, yeah. um, and you have to separate the two, if you're going to turn on Sean Hannity at night, you have to know that you're going to get probably stuff supporting Trump. That's that's his take. Right. But the new side different. of but the new side of Fox, they take very, very seriously there. And there are, as we always say, wonderful people that work there. Diana Falzone, I knew when I worked there, she was a great reporter. Um, and if this story is true, and there are many reasons to believe it is based off the piece, mm -hmm. um, 
that is a real, real problem for Fox, and it's a problem for the, the journalists that work there right. that want to break these stories. That is why they're there to do their job. And that, that is the biggest part of the story. If it comes out to be true, they've got a real problem on because their hands. Because it shows that the two now are conflated, right? The propaganda, the state-run television mm -hmm. part of it, the opinion part, has taken over the news function. Well, the boss, the other thing the boss is says. That, but the other thing is, if yeah. you're just a regular American watching Fox News, mm -hmm. it blends together. It goes from, you know, a show like Chris Wallace and Brett Baer, which is actual news, into people talking about, you know, out-and-out -out conspiracy theories yes. like prayer rugs at the border and the Soros-occupied State Department. And when that all gets... Some more lies. Just to, just to counterpunch mm -hmm. on that yeah. is... Uh, Donna Brazil was exposed in WikiLeaks for giving up a debate question from the Clinton campaign. And she, she resigned. She knew through CNN. Yes, I'm just saying, like, the debate question yeah. thing has now happened on both sides. Yes. Uh -huh. I would make the same argument about CNN commentators, that there's a lot of times that I don't know the difference between an opinion host and a journalist on CNN as well, so I think mm -hmm. this is a systemic problem with journalism in general. You're a great journalist. I don't know if you would disagree with me one way or the other. I will say... I totally agree on that. Yeah. I just think it'd be strange Thank for a you. news organization to kill a scoop like I that. I don't disagree yeah. with that, but I would also say that I also worked with mm -hmm. Diane, and she is a great journalist, and that some of the other elements at play in this, uh, you guys probably don't know who this is, but I do because I grew up in Scott Phoenix and Scottsdale are like 10 minutes apart, but mm -hmm. there's a gossip columnist named Nick Ritchie who ran a website called Dirty Scottsdale that turned into the Dirty. He's also involved in this, and what's interesting to me is a lot of times it's like the National Enquirer and gossip people that start with these stories and then it filters its mm. way up mm -hmm. one way or the other. And I think we maybe aren't giving people like the National Enquirer and Nick Ritchie enough credence for doing well, the other National kind of journalism. Well, the John Edwards story. Yeah. We have so, a legal note, Sonny. We do. We have a legal note. Excuse me. Uh, the former Fox News executive, Ken LaCour, accused of killing the story, has since reportedly said that he'd made the call without talking to superiors and claimed, quote, the story simply hadn't passed muster and that he didn't do it to protect Trump. Oh, baloney. The other thing I'm supposed to add is that the Gary Cohen story is alleged, him intervening in the State Department, but and Judd, I, read the New Yorker story. You know, Jim Mayer is a crack reporter. I must take issue about the CNN because we were at Anna Navarro's wedding yesterday and Wolf Blitzer was there. Yes. And he told us the funniest story. I just have to tell you the story. <laughs> He's got a two-year-old grandson and he said the kid goes, happening now, breaking news, <laughs> <Yes>. Trump. <laughs> I forgot about that. Sorry. Two years old. I thought that was so funny. His first sentence. <laughs> Happening now. Okay, coming up, Trump gave a two-hour speech at CPAC. We'll hit the highlights next. Stay tuned. <laughs> Trump was really in his element at the Conservative Political Action Conference, also known as CPAC, launching into a two-hour marathon speech where he went way off script. He thought he thinks he's a stand-up comic. Watch, <laughs> watch this. <laughs> New Green Deal, or whatever the hell they call it. Darling, is the wind blowing today? I'd like to watch television, darling. Russia, please, if you can, get us Hillary Clinton's emails. You put the wrong people in a couple of positions, and they leave people for a long time that shouldn't be there, and all of a sudden, they're trying to take you out with The Attorney General says, I'm gonna recuse myself. I'm gonna recuse. And I said, why the hell didn't he tell me that before I put him in? Please, he hugged that flag, so if he did any closer, hugging that flag, he would have to pay it hush money. <laughs> <laughs> so, um... You know, he, he seemed to be sweating a lot and very nervous and using a, 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 a you know, the Foul BS language. word. He didn't even say BS. I mean, he's, you know, he, just when you think he can't get any lower, he gets lower. Also, so, Jeff Sessions, by the way, was one of the first to ever endorse him. That's who he's making fun of, his first attorney general. He was, remember, he was the, one of the first guys to wear the, the Make America Great Again hat. Yeah, I can't feel sorry for Jeff Sessions, though. Anyway, go ahead. Yeah. No, nothing. <laughs> sorry. I don't. Yeah, I mean, I guess what I would just say is, again, it's, it's shocking that one political party in this country has become the party of Trump. I mean, it's a cult of yes, personality. That's right. And yes. you can look at CPAC and say, it's just the lunatic fringe. But the fact is, if you want a sense, I think, of where a lot of the Republican Party base is, you should go to CPAC mm -hmm. and see the way that they've become sycophants for these people. It's not about conservative Are you saying values. the base would not agree with CPAC? No, I'm saying they would. Yeah, I'm oh, saying they would. They, it's it's tragic that in two years, a party that 
had such principles. The party has Reagan, who they considered the saint of republicanism, has, is now the and, the and the party of family yep. values. Because that's what we were talking about it in the during the hot topics meeting, and I was saying, well, CPAC is it a think tank? You know, is it about conservative values? Because if you look at the folks that speak there, you're talking about vi the vice president, uh, Mike Pence, who was supposed to be, you know, this you know family values type person, um, Lindsey Graham, Ted Cruz, Donald Trump Jr., um, Glenn Beck, Liberty University's Jerry Falwell. Fowell, um, Larry Fowell, Kudlow, Fowell Jr. Uh, Fowell Jr. Sorry, mm -hmm. um, and, and so these are people that are supposed to be entrenched in the Republican Party. And again, is this the Republican Party any any longer, or is this mm -hmm. the Trumpican? Well, party? ninety. And a new Wall Street Journal ABC, NBC News poll found that ninety percent of Republicans approve of of Trump's work. Right but it's now. not just that. Forty six percent, according to a new NBC Washington Post poll. 46% of this country, according to this poll, approves of the job that the president is doing. So that is a Amazing. bigger conversation of, of where the mood of the country is and where a lot of the conversations in the media are. Except because I think there's a big disconnect sometimes with the, how people are feeling and the way people in the media are talking about Except it. Except 41% of voters say they'll vote for Trump. 48% say they'll vote for Democrats. So there's a 6% Well, it depends on lead. who the Democrat is, probably. Well, they're just saying a Democrat, any Democrat. I'll vote for any Democrat. So Pee-wee Herman. Pee-wee Herman, run. I'll vote for you. Pee-wee. I gotta go. Coming up, Jordan Woods gives her side to what she says really happened on her night out with Khloe Kardashian's ex, Tristan Thompson. We'll talk about that next. So take that. Just between. So, from one reality show train wreck to another, <laughs> let's talk about the Kardashians. Mm -hmm. It appears that the Khloe Kardashian Jordan Woods saga is continuing. Woods was accused of sleeping with Khloe's boyfriend, Tristan Thompson, which he just denied on Jada Pink and Smith, Pink and Smith's show, Red Table Talk. Here's her side of it. Watch. There was no lap dance involved. But my legs were, were laying right over his. On the way out, he did kiss me. The last thing I wanted to do was be that person. I'm no homewrecker. Right. I would never try to hurt someone's home. Right. Especially someone that I love. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm so I'm sorry. If anyone believes that they just kissed, they're insane. I know. Well, Chloe wasn't buying it. Like you. <laughs> Saying that Woods is a liar and blaming her for breaking up the family. She followed up with a tweet where she said Tristan was equally to blame. Why are the women so quick to blame other, other, the, other it's, woman? Because it's easier to blame the other woman. Obviously, we know I, I'm not even a, totally read up on the Kardashians at the moment. You have So much is happening every <laughs> second. But it's hard to What I know, I know enough to know that Tristan is a serial cheater. Right. Chloe obviously knows that, yeah. but she's decided to stand by her man or whatever. Mm -hmm. And it's much easier to blame the person that she's not close to than to blame the, the father of her child. And the word homewrecker always refers to a woman. So Am a I woman. right about that? Well, yeah. All there's he's no, the there's no male equivalent except he's a dog. Well, my mother it. always told me that you lose them how you catch them. And she, and he was with someone else. And that someone else was pregnant when she, when Chloe caught him. I'm just saying. Oh. And so oh, I did not know that. Yeah. Right. I mean, yeah, do I have it right? So you're so, up on this. Yeah. So you know, and he is a serial Sonny cheater. Is our designated yeah. Kardashian group. He is a serial All I will cheater. say is our office was watching this interview like they were watching the Michael Cohen hearings. I don't know what that says <laughs> about <laughs> us, the show, or this country. We've got Trump as president, and we've got the Kardashians right. at our headline every single day that dominate this show and, and everyone's lives. I, well, I don't know what that says about us. We have a President Kardashian, yeah. right? That's the whole I know. point. The whole point is that we are all living in a kind of distorted, upside-down reality yes. in which fame and celebrity are more important than substance. That's, That's what's happening. That's Thank exactly you for what's saying going that. On. That's Very exactly well said. where we're We'll be right back. We'll be right back. Tomorrow, American Idol judges Katy Perry, Lionel Richie, and Luke Bryan invade The View with host Ryan Seacrest to get into idol chatter about... And welcome back. You know, a hot topic that's come up several times at this table lately are accusations that some of the newly elected Democratic candidates are promoting anti-Semitism, which is a subject that our guest co-host Barry Weiss has spent her career writing about. So we're glad to have you here. And let me ask you this. Now, you are a proud Jewish girl. 
Yes, you had your bat mitzvah at, um, what's the name of the place? Tree of Life. The Tree of Life that was a mm -hmm. hip of the terrorist attack recently. Mm -hmm. And even though you have been writing and talking about anti-Semitism, something switched with you after that terrorist attack. Tell us about that. Well, I would say for the past decade or more, I've been watching, as all of you have, the rising anti-Semitism across Europe. Cemeteries being defaced, right. and a Holocaust survivor lynched in her apartment in Paris by her neighbors. Um, people getting beat up in the street for wearing a yarmulke or for speaking Hebrew in Berlin. I always thought that America was different. That it was different not just because of our love of religious liberty and the fact that the founders themselves always had embraced the Jewish population of this country, but the fact that we don't have a history of genocide and anti-Jewish pogroms, and the fact that we don't have a flood of immigrants from, from countries where anti-Semitism is the norm, but despite what it, Donald Trump would but say. But there's always been some anti-Semitism in this country. I remember during uh, World War II, the famously, uh, the St. Louis uh, ship was, was, turned was famously turned back to go, to go back to Germany because they would not accept it, him and them in this country, and yeah. FDR was our president at the time. Yes. So, there's always been country yeah. club anti-Semitism and having to change your name, anti-Jewish prejudice. What's different is mm -hmm. the fact that I thought America was an exception has changed. I am now worried that what we are seeing in Europe could be coming here, and that's for a few reasons. The main one of which is the fact that conspiracy-minded thinking, the idea that their Jews are a secret power that control the world, something that we see both on the right and the left is rising. And in a politics where there's no healthy middle ground, where there's no center, and where the lunatic fringe is rising on the left and on the right, you kind of have a perfect storm. On the right, you have the right, the far right saying the Jews aren't white and Christian enough. Alt-right, please. Alt-right, excuse me. And on the far left, you're hearing them say that the Jews are not victim enough. And so the Jews sort of have no place in American politics at the moment. And that is not a good situation the right, for anyone. Isn't so it can mostly I... coming from Muslims on the left? No, on the no. left, it's also coming from people who try and claim that their criticism is just about the state of Israel. When it's really not about criticizing Israeli policies, it's about saying that if all the flawed states in the world, all the flawed states, right. including Syria and Iran and North Korea and Russia and China, only one doesn't have the right to exist, and that is the Jewish right. state. Mm -hmm. So we've talked about this offline, personally, and now on the show, but it's easy to spot anti-Semitism when it's a bunch of crazy people with tiki torches screaming Jews will not replace us. Yes. What's trickier is tweets like Minnesota Congresswoman Ilhan Omar's recently deleted about how Israel has, quote, hypnotized the world to carry out, quote, evil. That is harder to spot as anti-Semitic, which makes it more dangerous, you think, how so? It does make it more dangerous because, as you said, when you see people marching with tiki torches or you hear the Pittsburgh killer writing on social media, all Jews must die, that's very obviously eliminationist. The problem with anti Semitism from the far left is that it often, oftentimes is smuggled into the mainstream under the guise of progressive values. So it says about itself, I'm just standing up for the downtrodden Palestinians, which they are. I am just standing up for justice. I'm standing against racism. And so th that kind of language is a siren song, including to Jews, 75% of whom vote for Democrats. And so that's the problem with it, is that it's not as easy to spot, oftentimes because it says, we're just about criticizing Israel. In the case of Did Ilhan Nancy Pelosi shut it down? Nancy Pelosi shut it down very aggressively mm -hmm. with Ilhan Omar. The problem is, is that she still has a spot on the, se on the right. Congressional Foreign Affairs Committee. And well, that's a real question. I want to I ask you a question because you, you're mentioning the Palestinians. Yep. And an independent UN report into last year's protests um, along Gaza's border fence involving Israeli security forces that resulted in the deaths of shooting deaths of more than 180 Palestinians concluded last Thursday that there are reasonable grounds to believe Israel violated international humanitarian law. Now, isn't it possible to oppose those human rights violations without being anti-Semitic? In other words, criticizing the policies, but not criticizing Israel. The, the answer is absolutely yes. Just as I am a proud American and I criticize Donald Trump's policy of separating families at the border, which you know more about law than me, may be a violation of international humanitarian law. Mm -hmm. That's 100% kosher. Does it make you anti-American? Not, not at all. It makes you, in fact, love America because you want it to stand up for its ideals. I'm a liberal Zionist. I am very critical of the policies of the current Israeli government. I believe that, that Bibi Netanyahu is selling out the legacy of the Holocaust when he 
makes common cause with leaders like Viktor Orban in Hungary. Uh, I believe that he is desecrating what the Jewish state is all about when he allows out-and-out -out racists into his political coalition. I'm saying all of that. I'm not an anti-Semite. That's about criticizing Israel. Where it crosses a line is when it becomes about dehumanizing Israel and Israelis and Jews. And when you say that the largest Jewish community on planet Earth, 70 years after the Holocaust, does not have a right to exist in, in the Jewish ancestral homeland. That's when it crosses a line. Okay. Thank you for that. Everybody has to speak out against this type of thing. It's disgusting on both sides. Um, Barry's book, How to Fight Anti-Semitism, will be out in the fall, so we will be looking forward to that. And we'll be right back. Thank you. Washington State's Governor Jay Inslee announcing he's the latest Democrat looking to take back the White House from Donald Trump. He's making climate change a focal point of his campaign. But given how ugly the last election was, how's he going to handle the political climate he's about to step into? Let's find out. Please welcome Governor Jay Inslee. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that you're doing this because that's my number one issue mm -hmm. and I really am happy that you're doing it. But how are you going to differentiate yourself from the rest of the Democrats who also say they want to change the climate? They want to work on that. I'm going to get Joy in the White House so we can have a climate change president. That's what I'm going to do. <laughs> we need this. Well, look, this is really simple. I, I've had a lot of success in our state. We've got the best economy in the country. We've got great pam, uh, paid family leave, big minimum wage increase. Yeah. We've had the biggest educational funding increase. We've legalized marijuana. A lot of success. But the reason fundamentally I'm running is because we need a president who will say this. Uh, America is going to defeat climate change. It is our destiny. And we will do this. And I'm convinced of this. But to do this, we have to have a leader who will say fundamentally and unequivocally that this is the number one priority in the United States. It has to be because of the nature of this challenge. This is the greatest peril we have, but it is also the greatest promise. Look, I went to Paradise, California a couple months ago and saw a town of 25,000 people. It looked like Europe after World War II. And when you stand there and you see the damage that we face and our grandchildren face, it demands the United Nations to confront this. And I think, look, I'm a child of the 60s. I remember when John F. Kennedy said we're going to the moon in 10 years and bring somebody back. And we went because that spark, that bugle of inspiration, united the country to a new mission statement. And I believe this is a new mission statement that is going to grow jobs okay. all over the United States. So, you know, That's why I'm running. Okay. Look, Joy, this is her number one issue. I right. think everyone in this room cares about the air we one? breathe. Well, I would uh, say it's my, because if we can't breathe, what's the point? It's of number one. A good economy. Oh. Yeah. And most but, Americans, uh, health care is number one, and right after it, it's climate change. Yeah. But for a lot of people, it's still the economy. Uh, yeah. And so I'm here listening to this, and I'm wondering, do you really want to win, or are you trying to get attention for this one issue? Because you're, it's not just about beating Democrats. You've got to beat Trump. Right. And you saw him at CPAC. Whether you agree with him or not, he knows how to get people riled up. He gets headlines. He gets attention. The media is always talking about him. Climate change, yeah. uh, that's not the number one issue for many, many people in this country. So how are you going to make waves on that? Well, I want a lot of things in life, but what I, I want most in life is to defeat Donald Trump and make him a big up in history. Here, here. So how do you Here's how we're going to do this. Here's how we're going to do this. Look. Your comment was very interesting. <laughs> Climate change is an economic growth engine. It is an ability to grow jobs. Today, clean energy jobs in the United States are growing twice as fast as the rest of the U.S. economy. The number one job creation rate today is in solar panel installers. The number two is in wind turbine technology. When Donald Trump said that, you know, we're not going to have toasters and TVs if we have wind power, that's just simply, I don't know, moronic is the best way I could say it. Because in my state, we now have a $6 billion wind turbine industry. Wow. And when I turn on the view in the morning, it always comes on. Mm -hmm. It works really, really well. Mm -hmm. So he is just such a <laughs> pessimist and a narrow-minded thinker. He needs to get with the rest of Americans that understand the country that sent a man to the moon can, we can develop a clean energy economy. That's what we can do. I fundamentally believe that. So that's my, my message. This but, is not but don't you need more than that if I'm you're sorry? running? Don't you need more than that as your main platform if you're going to run against a President Trump? Yes, we're going to talk about the economic growth inherent in clean energy. And I co-authored a book about this over 10 years ago. I helped uh, do the U.S. Climate Alliance. So I've been at this for about two decades. But I want to talk to people about the fact that this is a health issue, right? This is the health of our children. Our children in the state of Washington could not go outside and play last year. We had to shut down public pools because the forests were all burning and our kids could not breathe. We had the worst air quality in the world. 
we're better than that. This is a national security measure issue. Uh, Trump will not listen to his generals. I have, and I've, I've talked to, to uh, intelligence officials. This is a national security threat because it's going to drive mass migrations that de destabilize governments around the world. So this is not just an environmental issue. This is an issue that touches everything we hold dear. And I, and I just tell you, I, I take this personally. I got three grandkids. I've officially designated them the cutest kids in Washington. <laughs> and uh, I am dedicated that those kids do not live in a degraded world. That's my commitment. And I'm going to get up every day making sure they get that. All right. Maybe I am just a unicorn from another planet. But <laughs> climate change doesn't even hit my top 30 of how I vote for somebody. So I do think I am on this panel to say this isn't what's selling me on you beating Trump. And I say that with respect. Mm -hmm. What's also not selling me on beating Trump is the New Green Deal, which all of the 2020 contenders have endorsed. Mm -hmm. um, it would cost $93 trillion or to every person in this room, $600,000 per each of your households. Do you think that plan, thank you, ma'am, is practical <laughs> or have you endorsed it or do you have another option? Because when I hear that an average American is going to have to spend $600,000 for a new green deal, you can understand how people like me don't think that's logical. Well, this is a lot like the death panels you heard about in Obamacare. The Republicans mm -hmm. talked about death panels. Yeah. We didn't have death panels and we don't have $600,000 cost. Mm -hmm. This is a, a thing that I think has been helpful in our discussion. In a variety of ways. Number one, we're talking about climate change. That is a value. But we're also you, talking about high ambition. Could you give an example ambition. to just the average person in here how, mm -hmm. how they can help where it, do, it doesn't sound so irrational. I mean, we're talking about $51 trillion, the elimination of planes, uh, the elimination of cows, a railway, no planes. I guess nobody can go to Hawaii anymore. It doesn't sound that rational to me. Uh, it isn't rational because those are the things so that the Donald Green Trump Deal said. Is not we rational. are not going to eliminate cars. We are not going to eliminate trains. We're going to have what I have in my driveway today, which is a blue GM Bolt made in Michigan with American workers. That's what we're going to have, okay? We're going to have, we're going to have televisions powered by solar and, and wind energy. We're going to have potentially ways to fly airplanes on biofuels. Mm. We have flown a Boeing 737 aclo across the Atlantic Ocean now in biofuels developed in my state. The point is that when we think about our opportunities here, we can't be so narrow-minded. Look, you know, I grew up in the, the, the time of rotary phones, and now we got cell phones. We're going to have the greatest transformation of our econ economy that you can hardly imagine if we unleash this potential can of I, America. Can I just interject really quick? Yeah. I understand you're talking the talk and walking the walk, mm -hmm. but a lot of advocates don't. Ocasio-Cortez's campaign spent $30,000 on 1,500, excuse me, 1,050 Uber rides. Uh, Al Gore's home electricity <laughs> was 21 times the national average in 2017, even after a green overhaul. Leonardo DiCaprio prize, flies on private jets, including to an accept an environmental award in 2016. A lot of environmentalists don't walk the walk, they just talk the talk, and then they want the average American to spend $600,000 in their household, and none of this. They just said that wasn't really true. But, no. but, I'm, but the, that's what's proposed on the New Green Deal. Actually, that is not what is proposed. Let's get this straight. That is not proposed in the New Green Deal. Okay. Well, then so I, I guess, just want to be real straight about this. Then I guess, okay. Governor, you've got no problems with voters. Then we don't. We and, go. and let me. I have to cut you off, sir. And you have I hate to do it to you, but I'll be we, back. we have a time <laughs> yeah. restriction here, so I have to say thank you very much. You are walking the walk and talking the talk, and I'm right there with you. All right. Thanks, enjoy. To Governor. Yeah. addressing you accordingly today. We partner with vendors for at least half off some of this season's fabulous fashions while supplies last. So let's get shopping with Lunchbox. Oh, look at all the Love you, baby. Baby. How are you? I'm good. I am going to help you smile into spring okay. first with La Sarah. These are amazing little tanks, which you can yes. see I'm wearing, and I love them. The tunic tanks, all stylish, comfy collection. Comes in sizes small to 4X, so mm -hmm. it's inclusive and makes us smile. I love these, and the five pocket. This is a I pant, you guys. This. It looks like a jean, but it's soft like a knit, so it pulls right on. Yes. No, not, nothing hurting you or digging into you. I love these, and I love all the patterns. Original price on these, $45 to $69 for this collection. Okay. Not today. $22 bucks to $32. Right. Bucks. 50 to 54% off. You're going to love this now. Or Delphine, the leather 
satchel. Check this pebble leather satchel out. Just yes. like all incredible, Ooh, beautiful bonus satchels. Purse. And you can also do the little wallet. And the wallet has a detachable wristlet. Nice. Gold hardware. Totally genuine leather. And all these colors are amazing. Original on these bags, $195 to $395. Today's deal, $49 to $89. Now, I can't live without this, and I know you, when you oh, go to the hens, you're going to need yes. this, right? Convertible infinity scarf, you guys, with a secret pocket. Not just any pocket. This is a brand new fabric that's got a little shimmer and a whole lot of texture. I have one of these. Isn't it clever, my though? my friend Regina got one, too. I love that. You can put your phone, you can tell them, you can put your passport, yes. everything, your cash, your credit card. And it has a zipper. It's the coolest. You see? Original price on these, normally $40 bucks today's so deal. Good. $20. Bucks. Like put that on. She loves it. These two for the chickens. So oh. Jambu, it's called the Gwen Garden Ready Shoe, but I want to say I wore it this morning in the in the snow. Oh. The thing about these is not only is it that cool classic duck style, but it's got a totally, this is a weatherproof outsole, but the inside is memory foam. So they're comfortable and you can wear them all day, but check out the patterns and the good colors. For chicken coops. You know it, girl. You wash those right off. Okay, original price on these typically 49 bucks. You're gonna die. Today's deal, $24.50. This is saving a good the 50% off. Now, this is another one you're going to want because it's going to leave you hands-free. Lion Latch. So smart. So this okay. is a genius way to store your rings. Check it out. You put your rings right in there because when you don't want to lose something, you close that up and you can attach it to anything. Oh. Your belt loop, your your little, you know, the little zipper on your jacket. Anywhere, so Sunny. And all your valuables, your little rings and your jewelry can also put pills in here. Really smart. Perfect. Original price on these, $20. Not today. You get two. For ten bucks in a there set. Isn't it great? Okay. Skinny tees. Skinny tees is incredible because you obviously have an amazing shape with this wears. I love it because fabric keeps you nice and smooth. It also is cut a little longer so it doesn't roll nice. and it doesn't ride. You can do anything from the scoop neck, three-quarter sleeve, the tank with the skinny straps, or a classic little shell. And also, take a look, you guys. This three-quarter sleeve and new linen dress with oh, pockets. And nice. I layered it over a long sleeve, Sunny, so that you could wear it in the yes. winter. But once it gets warm, ta-da, we put on a little tank with no sleeves and we're good to go in the summer. Nice. I love soft. this collection. Isn't it great? Oh, and I have I like leggings on. I meant to tell you that. I, I have leggings on. Okay, original price on these, $28 to $76. Not today. $13 to $32. Bucks wow. For an amazing savings of 50 to 63 wow. percent off. Now, do you remember I have one of these? Yes. I know you and I love them because we don't have to we don't have to go in and have any bags. I love that. <laughs> I use these in the morning. I Can you believe it. it? And you have all your stuff in it. That's, that's the thing. You know what? And this here's the deal. One of my so 